Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. How are you, PYC Bicol? Are you enamored this uh, this evening? Yes. Are you enamored this evening? Yes. You have to uh, excuse me this evening. I decided to calm down because I feel like I'm too high. And the light is hitting my eyes, I cannot see very well, so that's why I'm here this evening. I am happy to be here. I am glad I am here, and the subject that we are discussing this evening, enamor, enamor, spicing up the soul, is one that I have discovered that is so important in our Christian life. This theme that we're talking about in this PYC B Core. And I, as I was thinking about what I wanted to share for tonight and tomorrow night, I decided to stick to the key text for this uh, PYC. And our key text is found in Philippians chapter three, verse eight. We're gonna spend time reading that uh, tonight. Don't worry about it. But I want to discuss tonight and tomorrow night what it means to be enamored. Are we together, everybody? Yes, are we together? I want to talk about what does it mean to be enamored, to be in love, to be connected to Jesus Christ. I've entitled the thoughts for tonight as enamored with Christ. I would like you to turn to your neighbor and tell them that I want to be enamored with Christ. Can you turn to your neighbor and say that? Turn to your neighbor and kindly say, I want to be enamored with Christ. We're going to do it one more time. And I want to say, I want you to say it with life. Turn to your neighbor and say, I want to be enamored with Christ. Let's pray. Father, this is your moment. Speak to our hearts. In your name I pray. Amen. In Philippians chapter 3, what chapter everybody? You know, I'm the type of preacher who, when I preach, I like response. So, be ready to respond tonight. Is that alright? Yes. Is that alright? Yes. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul is, is fighting through words against people that focus more on the outward things of religion than the inward things of religion. In Paul's day, he was fighting with people who we call Judaizers. What do we call them, everybody? Yes. What do we call them? Yes. The Judaizers believed that you had to keep the law in order to be righteous. The Judaizers believed that you had to keep to be circumcised in order to be righteous. The Judaizers had their confidence, please don't miss this, they had their confidence in what they did for righteousness. And so for Paul, he starts to fight with the Judaizers by making the point that I myself, as Paul the Apostle Paul, I should have confidence in the flesh. I, the Apostle Paul, should be able to say by my outward works, by the things that I do, by the externals of religion, please follow me, by the externals of religion, the outward acts, I should be counted righteous. Let's look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 4. Paul 
Paul says, talking about, verse 5 rather, talking about the confidence you should have in the flesh, talking about the outward acts of religion. Paul says, circumcise the what? Circumcise the what? Oh, when we're dead already. Come on, people. I want to respond. Uh, we are enamored with Christ, right? You're sleepy. Tulo, 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 ka? Tulo, ka, you? You want to sleep? I, I will just take a few moments of your time, and then I will let you go. Is that okay? Yes. So if you respond, I'll preach really fast. Is that okay? Yes. Let's, let's read. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, the Bible says, or oh, you cannot see, or oh, let, let's wait for the projector to be adjusted. I thought he was about to kill me. Can you see that, everybody? Yes. All right, let us read together. The Bible says, Circumcise the what? Of the stock of? Of the tribe of? And Hebrew of? As touching the law? Concerning sin. Persecuting the? Touching the righteousness which is in the law? Paul is saying that if you are to talk about a a, a true Israelite, I am a true Israelite. I was circumcised on the right day. I was not ex ex uh, circumcised on the ninth day or the tenth day. I was circumcised on the eighth day according to the law. Paul goes on to say that I am of the people of Israel. I am not a Gentile. I am not a, a, a Roman. I am not a so-and-so. I am a true-blooded Israelite. Paul goes on to say, I come from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, if you are very aware, is that the tribe of Benjamin is where we had the first king of Israel. And before Paul became Paul, he was Saul. So his name even resembled the first king of Israel. So Paul goes on to say, and furthermore, he says, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I am the true Israelite. My heritage, who I am, is Israelite, Israelite. Paul could say, if he was here today, I am a Filipino, Filipino. I am a true Bicolano. I, I, I am who I am. I come from Camarines Norte. That's Bico itself. I am born and bred as a Bicolano. That's what Paul is saying. He goes on to say, as touching the law, a Pharisee, if you want to see someone who is serious about doing the law, keeping the law, doing the right thing, I am that person. Paul goes on to say, concerning zeal or concerning energy or concerning a, a, a desire for God, doing the things for God, I am the one. If you want to see a person who is serious about their devotion for God, I am it. If you want to see a person who will never miss a PYCB call, I am the person. If you want to see a person who gives time, a person who prays, a person who is serious, I am that person. Paul goes on to say, Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. If you look at me and how I keep the law, I have no sin in my life. And so Paul, in order to fight against the Judaizers to make his point about being confident in the flesh, about uh, focusing on the outward aspects of religion, he says, I have it. I have it. I am not missing in anything. But something happened to the Apostle Paul. 
on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9 verse 6. The Bible reads, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? The text goes on to say, and the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. I want to suggest to you that on the road to Damascus, the apostle Paul was enamored with Jesus. And how do I know this? When you read in Philippians chapter 2, he talks about Jesus. And he says things like this about Jesus Christ. In verse 6 of chapter 2, of Philippians, who being in the form of God, thought it not rather to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Take note of the last verse. The Bible says, and being found in fashion as a man, Jesus, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. The Apostle Paul understood in his life that Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, brought himself down from heaven and died the death of a sinner. The King of Glory humbled himself. And so Paul understood that through the death on of the cross, Jesus did something on his behalf. And he concluded like this in, in 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to do what? Save sinners of who I am? Chief. On the road to Damascus, the Apostle Paul became enamored with Jesus. And the word enamored means to be in love with someone. Paul understood that Jesus Christ died for his sins. That Jesus Christ took his place on the cross. Do you know that Jesus Christ did this for you? That he died for your sins and mine. You and myself are in PYCB call because of what Jesus Christ did for you and myself. Amen. Amen. Now, go back to Philippians chapter 3. In verses three, uh, verses seven to eight, which is our main focus tonight, and which is our key text for this PYCB call, the Apostle Paul, after talking about all he is that he has, he changes, and he begins by making a a, a, a sharp distinction to drive his point home. He says like this in verse seven and eight. The word but is a, is a strong word that conveys negation. You have said something, then when you say but, you are saying that what has been said is not so important. What I'm saying now is what is important. Are we together, everybody? Are we together? Yes. Now the Bible says, but what things were gained to me before being converted? My status as a person, my, my faith as a Pharisee, my righteousness, he, these are the things that he's talking about. He says that these things, that what things were gained to me, those I counted what? Uh, come on, God's people. Those I counted what? For Christ, yea, doubtless, and I all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do come <laughs> then but them that I may win Christ now notice the words that I've highlighted on the screen the apostle Paul is using words in a, words that have a, an application to a marketplace are we together everybody 
we have our market just far, just nearby us. So Paul is imagining himself going to the market. And he is making a deal. He is bargaining. Are we together, everybody? He says like this, the things that were gained to me, the things that were important to me, that I've just told you about at the beginning of the sermon, those things, I count them but loss. They are no longer profitable to me. But now he says, yet doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. So Paul is doing a, an accounting uh, exercise. It's like he has a balance sheet. He says my assets were this and this and this. My family background was my asset. My religious heal for God was my asset. My righteousness in keeping the law was my asset. But now that is no longer an asset for me. It is rather a liability. But now what is an asset for me is the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. Are we together? And then he goes on to say that for whom I, Jesus, have suffered the loss of all things. Paul lost everything. And do count them but down that I may win Christ. Now notice what Paul says in the last word at the end of the verse. What is that word? What is the word? The last word that... The last word after count. What is the last word after count? What is that word? It starts with a D. The word is what? Down. The way to understand this word, if we are talking in Filipino, this word is basura. That's what the word is. But he is not talking about basu, basura. Uh, sad to say, but in the worship house we have trash. This is basura. Okay, this is basura. Sad, sad to say, this should be clean, but anyway, we have basura right here. But what he's talking about, he is imagining himself, he is imagining himself eating on a, on a table. Now, think with me. If you are eating, or, or rather, if somebody offers you a plate of tira tira, you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? Tira tira, well, what is tira tira? Leftovers, right? If somebody offers you tira tira, how are you going to feel? Let's say you wake up tomorrow morning and uh, the food that is given to you is tira tira, how are you going to feel? You feel what? Sad. I mean, I feel a little bit, uh, a little bit angry. Now, follow, follow, follow this. What Paul is saying? He's saying like this. The things that I had before, that is dear, dear. But now the thing that I have is the in the law. So the point I want to make in your life, I mean, uh, the point I want to make uh, as, as, I, as I make this, uh, as I'm preaching this message is this. To be enamored with Christ is the realization that anything that hinders my growth with Christ, I need to remove out of the way. Are we together, everybody? 
Anything that will not allow me to grow with Christ, I need to remove out of the way. Notice what the Apostle Paul says concerning this. Notice what he says in verse 9. And be found in him not having what? Come on. Not having my own what? Which is of the Lord, but that which is through faith of Christ. The righteous and which is of God by faith. You see, Paul understood that these things that he considered so important before he was converted, he realized that they were getting in the way of his relationship with Jesus Christ. And when he's speaking in this verse, he is thinking that when Jesus Christ comes, I need to be found in him, rooted in him, my right is to be in him. Are we together, everybody? So what actually was happening in his life is that though he, 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 he thought that he was someone, he was actually nobody. Though he thought he was someone, he realized that he was actually nobody. And I know this because when you look at what Paul has to say in Romans chapter 10, verse 1 to 3 he says like this brethren my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, saved. for I bear the record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge, knowledge. what is he saying in chapter in verse 8 for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ he is saying that my brethren they have a desire for God they want to the right thing but they don't have a knowledge of him they don't know him they don't know him the question is as you, as you are sitting right here listening to me do you know Jesus Christ you see for Paul and I want to, to, for you to understand my friends this is very important we can do the right thing we can go to PYC be call. we can go to church we can do this we can do that but none of that matters if we don't have a knowledge of who God is are we together he continues to say for they be ignorant that's a, a word of not knowing of God's righteousness are going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And this is what was wrong with Paul in his life. Though he had all of those things I just told you, he did not have a righteousness of God. He didn't have a knowledge of God. There was something lacking in his life. Excuse me, my laptop is, uh, is going to... Now, while we understand that it is important to, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but I find that many of us fall into a problem, into a into a trap many a times. And let me illustrate it this way. You have just received a new pair of shoes, sapatos. How do you treat those new pair of shoes? You take care of them, right? You shine them up. You put them in a, in a nice place. When you receive a new laptop, <laughs> Brother Ayas, you take care of it. You, you, you put it in the right place. You unplug it at night before you sleep. If you have a, a new friendship or a new relationship, you want to call that person, you want to talk to that person. You know, you're, you're very excited. I want to get everybody. Are you understand what I'm trying to say? We are often when we get something new, we are enamored. We are enamored by 
excited? Are we together? You are excited. It's lovely. It's nice. But, but I, I, often I discover that after you use that pair of shoes, after you use that laptop, after you get to know that person, that friend, you are not so careful to take care of the shoes anymore. You are not so careful to take care of the laptop anymore. You are not so careful to call the person or talk to them. You say, I, I know, I know that person anyway. So all that time, now most of the time, is that we we don't we are not enamored anymore by those new things because they have become tanda. They have become old. When it is new, ah, oh my God, nah. But when it is old, ah, that is a useless thing anyway. I discovered that this is exactly how we treat Jesus Christ. This is how we are. When you are converted and you are baptized the very first time, you are serious about going to church. You are serious about praying. You are serious about studying the word of God. You are serious about PYC Bicol. You are serious about doing the things of God, voice of you, and the rest of it. But after a while, you find that you find yourself going to church late. You, you, you can miss a PYC Bicol. You're not so so enamored anymore. I don't know if I'm speaking to you this evening, if you're hearing what I'm saying. Can, can you relate to what I'm talking about? Yes. Does it make sense? Yes. That we are often enamored with Jesus, but over time we are not enamored anymore or as much. Listen to these words that Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2 verse 4. He writes, or rather the, the John the Revelator is writing. And Jesus is speaking. Jesus says like this. I know. I know thy. And thy. And thy. And, thou, and, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And hast found them liars. He goes on to say. And thou hast. And hast, and for my name's sake hast, and hast, has not. Verse four. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast thy first love. Paul is, Jesus is saying the very same thing I'm just saying to you. He's talking to the church of Ephesus. He's saying, I know your works. I know your labor. I know your patience. I know how serious you are about me. I know, I know all of these things. But I have a problem with you because you have left your first love. You have abandoned me. The word left in this, in this passage can be understood as something that someone does deliberately. Many times in the Bible, the word left is what we have to forgive. Do you forgive by force or by choice? By what? By choice. So when Paul says, and when, when, when Jesus says, you have left your first love, he's saying that you have left me by choice. And then maybe you might say, oh, Peter, uh, you don't understand my situation. I have met challenges along the way. I have met struggles along the way. My family doesn't support me in my faith. I am struggling in temptation. I have fallen into this sin. I have fallen into something. You don't understand my situation. In my family, we have no money to go to church or to school. My, my family is sick. Somebody is sick, ready to die. So you don't understand about my struggles, but I'm, I'm going through You don't understand my situation. So how can you say I have left Jesus? Jesus left me. He left me. Listen, my friends. No one can put a gun to your head and tell you to commit this sin. 
not even the devil himself, he cannot do that. Everything we do is by choice, one way or another. So when we are not so enamored with Jesus anymore, when we are not so connected to Jesus anymore, that's all on you and me. It's all a choice. And if I was telling you about the Apostle Paul, he should be the one who can say, yes, I need to leave Jesus after all of the struggles he went through. When he's writing in Philippians, he's actually in prison. And then he talks about the joy of the Lord. So there is no excuse to leave the Lord. There is no excuse to abandon the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no excuse not to be enamored anymore. Amen. So my friends, it is all on us. And I want you to look at verse 8 once more in Philippians chapter 3 verse 8. This is our key text. When you look at the verse in many different versions of the Bible, I was so I was interested in how other version of the Bible puts it. When you look at the King James Version, it says like this. The excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. The New American Standard, I mean, the New American Standard Bible says like this. The surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The NIV, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The infinite, the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The point I want you to understand is that Paul is trying to tell us that we need to remember something. That there is nothing in this world that can surpass knowing who Jesus is. The things that you are going through right now in your faith experience cannot surpass the value of knowing who Jesus is. The struggles that you're going through cannot surpass who Jesus is. To get an education cannot surpass who Jesus is. To attend PYCB call cannot surpass who Jesus is. There is nothing, absolutely nothing in this world. And that's why Paul says, I count all things but rubbish. Kalat, kalat, tira, tira. They, they're nothing compared to knowing who Jesus Christ is. You see, Paul, I believe, took seriously the words of Jesus in Matthew 16, verse 26. Let's read together. So what is a man profiting if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Paul understood that nothing this world has to offer is better than Jesus Christ. Nothing. 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 I like these words of the apostle. Get it to the end. Paul says like this in Galatians 2 verse 20. I am crucified with who? Christ. Nevertheless I do what? Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by of the Son of God. Who did what? And did what? You see, my friends, I, I want you to understand something. Many a times we are not resolute enough in our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why we we tend not to be so in love with Him anymore. But what, if anything, I want you to understand out of this message is that we need to decide within ourselves that no matter what, no matter what comes my way, every day I will be connected to Jesus. Every day I'm going to die afresh unknown to Jesus Christ. This is how Paul did it. He didn't have any magical powers to stay close to Jesus Christ. 
But every day within his heart, he remembered that Jesus Christ loves him and Jesus Christ gave himself for him. So my friends, to be enamored of Jesus is a choice that we make on a daily basis. To be in love with him, to be on fire for him, to live for him is a choice we make every day. No matter what comes our way. To be enamored with Christ is a desire to say, you know what? No matter what comes my way, no matter what it is, if it gets in the way of my relation with Jesus, I'm going to take it out of the way. For Paul, he had to take away all of those things. For some of us, we might have to take away some friends. We might have to take away some video games. We might have to take away some movies. We might have to take away certain loves that we have. There are certain things in our lives that are simply competing with Jesus. There are just some things that we hold more important in life than who Jesus is. Than getting to know who he is. So if we are to be enamored with Christ, my friends, we might have to do like what the Apostle Paul does. Did. That is, to make a decision that there is nothing that I will allow to get in my way with my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing. Nothing. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about how to spice up our soul, how to live in and enlighten that relation with Jesus Christ. But I want you to understand that to be in love with Jesus Christ, we must make a decision on a daily basis. And so my friends, I come to the end of my message this evening. And I want to make an appeal to you because I believe the word of God has found a place in your heart, amen? The word of God has said something to you this evening. And how we're going to do this very soon. After I finish making my appeal, I'm just going to ask you to kneel down. You're going to pray and ask God to meet you where you need him to meet you. To respond to you as he should. You don't need to come up front. You don't need to tell me what it is. You're going to talk to God about it. But I'm going to make an appeal and a challenge to you. And I'd like you to respond. And how we respond, we're going to kneel together. You pray, then I'll pray at the end. Matter of fact, I'd like to ask my brother Ronald to come and pray for us at the end. The appeal is like this. Preacher, I have never had a relation with Jesus Christ. But I wanted to begin today. I've been baptized, I go to church, I go, but I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I cannot say that I want to give up all of these things for him. But I, I desire to, to get to that place where I'm so in love with Jesus that nothing is going to get in my way with him. Preacher, I want to have that experience. The second appeal is like this. Preacher, I was once enamored with Christ. I was in love with him. But I have grown cold. I am not the same. I don't like praying, I don't like reading, I don't like doing these things that I used to do before. I have fallen back into my old sins, but today I feel inspired to reconnect with Jesus. Please let us kneel together as we pray, as we respond. I'm going to ask my brother to come up front. I'm going to pray for about a minute and then he will pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for shining the light of your love upon us tonight. And I thank you for enlightening us through the life of your manservant Paul. while calling himself the chief of sinners, acknowledged boldly that I counted loss, I count everything else lost and dung and everything else is worthless. I'm willing to put all else aside, said Paul, to gain Jesus Christ my Lord. Lord, we thank you for the life of Paul, for he felt, understood, and experienced you clearly and dearly. And tonight, oh dear Lord, we want to have the same experience. And we are here for that very experience because in the discussion on devotional lives and Bible study and prayer, we have been learning more and more through the discussion on music and tomorrow on dress and media and all these things we are beginning to learn that every other love that surrounds us is cheap and of no value. We need the God who is love, who alone can teach us what love is. And Lord, you desire to fill us not with any cheap love but with the highest love in the universe which is Jesus Christ himself. And so it is, O oh dear God. We kneel in your presence begging you to open our eyes as you did to your manservant Paul and to my dear son Henry to be able to point out that everything else in our life is worthless and dumb. What we really need is Jesus. We plead with you then, O oh Father, that you alone may create in us that disgust and hatred for sin and a deep, profound love for righteousness. Help us, O oh Father, that we may not chase the form, but chase Jesus Christ himself. Father, we give to you our lives. I want to praise you, for my heart is overjoyed to see how you have worked in wonders to bring us here. But Lord, we are not content. We want Jesus in our life like never before. We want him to win us and not the world. We want you to overcome every other worldly power seeking to gain control and to fill us, Lord, today. As you have spoken through your man's servant, we want to be filled, not with the love of this world, but filled with love for Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. We thank you for you have promised that if we let you in, it is you who works in us both to do of your will and of your good pleasure. And so it is that we knock on your door tonight, pleading that you may break through this door of ours and do what we cannot do on our own. Father, thank you once again. Thank you once again for pointing out the worthlessness of that which surrounds us and that which is going to burn. Thank you for reminding us that we are to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And I thank you for Jesus Christ, that pearl of great price. I plead that we may every day, O oh Lord, value you and treasure you above anything else. We thank you once again for speaking to us clearly, distinctly, deeply and profoundly. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who is still striving with us. Dear God, please don't let us go. Please don't let us go. I pray for these campgrounds. I pray for every attendee, every participant, everybody in every committee that's organizing. May you please anoint everyone that none may leave without being filled with that deep love for Jesus Christ. 
And Lord, may we not just leave these grounds saying, yes, we have met Jesus, but may we leave these campgrounds with Jesus. May we go everywhere with him and filled with him may we talk, act, and love the way Jesus did. Be please, Father. Take us, please, good Lord, in the sweet embrace of your arms. Allow us to hear that heartbeat again as we did on our first moments with you. May we come back, repeat the old works that we did, and be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. May this be ours, Father. This is our prayer, O oh Father, which you have heard, and we praise you, for you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.